Okay. So what we did, we did the evaluation and we did uh, four problems last time. I show you how to do those problems that you have to do them, finish them up for the homework. <coughs> the only one that we did the uh, we did the present worth analysis, we did the annual method, and we did the benefit cost ratio analysis. Now, the last one that I want to do before cost effectiveness analysis is rate of return analysis. On rate of return analysis, I'll give you a simple example and then we do your homework problem. Um, let's assume that your initial cost of an alternative is going to be, you have two alternatives, let's say costing $10, the other one 20 and your return after first year will be 15 and will be 28. So what would be your rate of return on A? So you invest $10 and at the end of the year, you end up with 15. What would be your rate of return? Fifty percent, correct. So you make fifty percent on your money. How much did you make on your money with the alternative B? Forty percent. Okay. So basically, you divide your profit by your amount of investment. That's how you get it. Five dollars divided by ten, you get fifty percent. Eight dollars divided by twenty, you get forty percent. Okay. Now the question is, which one is better? If I have to choose between A and B, which one do you choose? Okay. Somebody say A. Okay, does everyone agree with the A? Anybody goes for a B? A? So is the A is the best one? Okay. Those of you who have had engineering economics, you should know by now that we don't really know which one is better. So if you ask me which one, I said, I don't know. It all depends. Depend on what? Depends on how much interest the outside is paying us. So the outside is the bank. Let's say the bank, Whatever they pay, we call that minimum attractive rate of return. That's what the bank pays. So let's assume that the bank pays 10% on your money. If I have $20, what I can do is Spend $10 on A and put the other $10 at the bank. So on the $10 that I make, uh, that I invest, I make $5. On the other $10 that I put it at the bank, I make 10% on it. So I make $1 on that. So my total profit for my $20 will be $5 from the A and plus $1 from the bank. So it makes it $6. So if I make $6 on A, $8 on B, 
which one would be better? Simple question. I make six dollars in A, eight dollars in B. Which one is better? B. Correct? You guys all said A. Okay, B. Now, it could be that my minimum attractive rate of return, if the bank or some other investment give me 40% on that extra $10, then how much money do I make in A? I make $5 plus $4 from the second $10. So I make nine. In that case, which one is better? A, correct? So it could be in general A or a B, all depends on how much is the interest that I get from the difference between these alternatives, which is what? That 20 minus $10, which is 10. So if the amount of interest that they pay me on that difference is high, so if the bank is high, then A would be better, the lower cost alternative. If it's a small, then we go with the B. So to figure out this type of problem rate of return analysis, what we have to do is we have to subtract the lower cost from the higher cost. So B minus A. So 20 minus 10 is 10. And the amount of profit will be what? 28 minus 15 is 13. So rate of return on B minus A is 30%. So that's the break even. That means that if the bank pays 30%, <coughs> both alternatives are the same. Both of them make $8. Do we call this one delta ROR? That means that incremental rate of return. So we have to get the in rate of return on the difference between the alternatives and then compare it with minimum attractive rate of return. If that gets to be greater than minimum attractive rate of return, we go with the higher cost alternative. Why? Because this is your rate of return on investment. This is what they give you outside. If your investment makes more money than outside, you want to put all your money on the investment. So you go with the higher cost, which in this case would be B. If the investment, which is Delta ROR, is going to be less than minimum attractive rate of return, you don't want to put all your money in the investment because it pays less than outside. You want to put some of your money outside. Therefore, you go with the lower cost alternative. Which in this case would be A. Any question on that? So if you understand this problem, which is a very simple problem, you should understand rate of return analysis which we're gonna use on the problem that we have as a homework. 
So the key is you got to get the difference between the cost and the benefit, which is B minus A. You have to find the rate of return on that. Once you find that, then you compare it with the minimum attractive rate of return, which the problem usually give you. So two choices. One is one, <coughs> your rate of return is higher than minimum attractive rate of return. So you go, <coughs> you go with the higher cost alternative. And when it's less, you go with the lower cost alternative. Yes, it is given always. That's the interest rate that they give you at the problem. All right. Okay. Now let's go to the problem that we have to do. And that's problem number um, two. They say using the figure of problem one, conduct an internal rate of return analysis for the selection of the most economic scheme. All right, let me see if I have that picture that we can put in. So you have that problem anyway. Okay, somehow, I don't know, I can't find my picture on it. Maybe I do, no. All right, just let's go back to the problem. Um, you guys got the problem, the same problem that's as the number one. Okay, we had that problem, which we did the benefit cost analysis, number one. Okay, there were four alternatives, do nothing, A, B, C, so, so we had the alternative, do nothing, A, B, C, and then we had the cost, initial cost, was 6,500. 10,200 and 17,500, correct? Now the maintenance cost was 250, 170, 190, right? No, it's not an example, it's your homework problem. We did that last time. Okay, your user cost. Okay, that's on page uh, 321. 
your homework problem. That's number two. Okay, user cost 8,000, 6,500, 5,600, and then 4,500. Your salvage is uh, nothing on the do nothing, 500 here, 1,200, and 2,500. Okay. Now they ask us to do by rate of return analysis and ask, they are asking us which alternative would be the best alternative. All right. Now in order to do that, we can compare a pair at a time, which we did with the benefit cost analysis. So the first one I said A versus do nothing. Okay, A versus do nothing. Remember what we did on the previous problem. We subtract the cost from each other and we subtract the benefit from each other and then we found the rate of return on that. That was a B minus A, you remember that? We find the rate of return, which we call it Delta ROR. That's what you wanna do here. So if I subtract the cost from each other, will be A versus do nothing. So it will be 6,500 minus zero, correct? Like. 20 minus 10 that we had on the other problem. That's at the present. Another cost that we have is a salvage value. Salvage value always is part of the cost. So plus, in this case, if this is a cost, we call that minus, and then the salvage value is plus. 500 minus zero, difference between the salvage values. But this is in the future. If it's in the future, we have to bring them to present. So if you have a payment in the future, how do you bring them to present? You multiply that by P over F. Okay? The interest rate, we don't know because that's what we want to find. That's what we call it Delta ROR. So we call that I percent. And how many years they have it for uh, 30 years. Okay. So that's the difference between the costs. It's like when I did the B minus A, remember 20 minus 10? I said 10 is the difference. That's what the, the, the difference is here. Difference between the cost. Any question on that? Now the benefit. If you remember, we could call the benefit what? The difference between Maintenance cost and the user cost. And we said these are all annual because user cost usually annual, maintenance cost is annual. Now the difference between the benefits like 28 minus uh, 15 that I did on the other problem, which was 13. I'm going to do the same thing here. So this would be plus the profit is 250 minus 170. So that's the user, that's the saving of the better in the maintenance. And the other saving that we have is plus 8,000 minus 6,500. Correct? 
So those are the two saving, we call it benefit. So I'm gonna close this bracket here at the end. Since these are annual, so if it is annual, if I want a P, if I have the A, what do I multiply by? P over A, correct? So I multiply this by P over A. And I percent, which I don't know what it is, and 30 years. And the whole thing will be equal to zero because all the benefit and cost should balance. So that's how we find rate of return, which we call that delta ROR. Any question of how we did this? I subtract the cost from each other, brought everything to present. I subtract uh, the uh, difference between maintenance cost and user cost and brought it to present and put it equal to zero. Now what you have to do, <coughs> you have to use trial and error to find what the I is. So for instance, if you try something like, I don't know, let's say 10%, okay, for I, and you calculate it, and that comes to be a positive number. You try, let's say 15% and turns out to be negative number. So then you know it's somewhere between 10 and 20. So you could write here delta ROR between 15 and 20 and 10. Somewhere there, some number, we don't care what it is. If that will be the case, the problem give you the rate of return, minimum attractive rate of return, they gave you is of 10%. So 11%, 12%, 13%, whatever it is, it's gonna be greater than 10%. If that's the case, means your investment is better than you put your money outside. So which one do we go with? We go with the higher cost alternative. And which one is a higher cost alternative? Is the A. So A is better than do nothing. So comparing A versus do nothing, we find A is better than do nothing if this is happening. I don't know, I have not done the calculation. So you have to do the calculation. But if that to be less than 10%, then do nothing is better. Any question on that? So once you find the A is better than do nothing, what do you do next? You do the same thing, A versus B. to see if A is better or B is better. So if A was still better than B, you compare with the A versus C and you get the best alternative. So that would be the rate of return analysis. So you have to finish this problem. I put the equation exactly. So all you have to do is just replace this other different number and find the interest rate on it. Okay, any question? How to get the percentages?
What do you mean the equation? I have the equation right here. This is the equation. This is the equation. Okay? So you just put, instead of P, P over F, you try for, for instance, 10%, 30 years, see what number it is. You put P over A, 10% and 30 years, see what number it is. And you multiply and add, and find out what would be the final number. And if that is positive, maybe you go with the higher number until you get a negative because zero is somewhere in between. So you want to have a positive and negative on both sides. Okay, any other question? All right, so that's the rate of return analysis. So you subtract the cost of one from the other and cost include initial cost and salvage value. But salvage value will be the opposite direction because on the cost you pay, on salvage value you receive. And bring it to present, the salvage value because salvage value is always future. And the benefits are annual, so you have to bring them to present. So you subtract the saving that you get on maintenance cost, the saving that you get on the user cost, and bring those saving to present. All right, any other question? All right. So that's the rate of return analysis. The next thing we want to talk about, so we talk about all the method, present work. So you have five problems to do. I have put it on your assignment, on your module. You have to do problem number one, problem number two, and problem number three, you have to do them two ways. One, by present work analysis, and one by annual method and then problem number four. So those five problems that you have to do, plus the questions that you always give me. Two questions from this chapter and two questions from chapter four, which we will talk about hopefully today. All right, another thing that we wanna do is we call it cost effectiveness analysis. Professor? Yes. Can you repeat uh, problem number three is two-way, which two-way? I'm sorry? Uh, problem number three, we have to do it in two ways. Which, what two-way? Okay, is the present work analysis and annual method. I talked about it last time. Okay. Present work and annual method. One one time you have to take everything to present, benefit and cost, subtract from each other. And on the annual method means you have to get the, all the benefit in A, all the costs in A and subtract from each other. That's the annual method. I went over that last time. Okay, any other question? All right, so the last one is the cost effectiveness. <coughs> okay, on the cost effectiveness analysis, this is the method that's mostly used for all our evaluations. So all the other method that we talk about is part of this method. But when we want to evaluate any transportation project, we use cost effectiveness analysis. And what is that? 
the reason that we do this method is that there are a lot of costs and benefit that we cannot quantify it, which means that we cannot put a dollar value on it, or it's very difficult to put a dollar value. For instance, if I design the two highways and I want to get the cost, yes, I can get the cost of construction, okay, bridges, right away, all of those costs, I can get it. But how about the cost of air pollution? For instance, this highway may be close to the residential area and causes a lot of air pollution and noise pollution compared to this highway that is middle of the farmland. So how do I incorporate the cost of air pollution into this and no noise pollution into the uh, formula? It's very hard to quantify air pollution or noise pollution. But that's the cost that causes people to suffer. So that's the cost. Or if I'm building this road in an area where there are a lot of residential area and I have to ask them to sell their home and move out, although I pay for the home, but there is a psychological cost associated with it. I'm moving these people who lived there for many, many years. Now I have to tell them, go somewhere else. Maybe they will not be happy. So where does that cost come from? How do I put dollar value on that? Very difficult. Or in this freeway, if because of way that it has been designed, maybe there are more accidents on that because we might have sharp curves and so on. So if so many people get killed here per year, if 100 people get killed here and 50 people get killed here, that extra 50 people that get killed in this highway, that's the cost. How do I put value on the people's debt or people's life? It's very difficult or if they get disabled injuries, how do I put a dollar value on it? So it is much more difficult to do that. So these are the costs that are not quantifiable. We cannot quantify them easily, but we have to have it in our evaluation. And there are benefits. For instance, if this highway goes by the ocean, and you have a great scenery. And that benefit is better than the other highways. So you are enjoying it while you are driving. So how do I quantify the scenery? Or maybe going by the ocean, breath of ocean, the air. How do I quantify those? Very difficult. So for that reason, we cannot only rely on benefit cost analysis, present worth, annual method, rate of return. We cannot do that. We have to incorporate all these costs and benefit that we cannot quantify. So to do this type of a problem is simply what we are going to do is, first of all, we're going to write our objective. What is the our objectives? <clears throat> Could be several. Okay, for instance, our objective here, maybe you want to design a highway that takes you fastest to go from one point to another point. You want to design a highway that has the least amount of impact on the, uh, of the environmental impact, such as air pollution, noise pollution, and so on. You want to have, uh, uh, your objective is to have the least number of accidents. You want to have an objective that will have less number of people removed while you are building it. 
So you can have all these objectives. Now, based on this objective, you set up your criteria. So you put the criteria, several criteria you create, and so on. So the objective is that take you fastest. So travel time could be the one of the objective. So least travel time. Maybe the second important objective could be something else like uh, safety, environmental impact. And then initial cost. Okay. Uh, not close to resident. So you can have a bunch of criteria here. You can create that. Now, the first thing you have to do is you have to see which of these criteria are the most important criteria for you. So if they tell you, they usually tell the judges, okay, give us between zero and 10, the criteria that are most important to you. So in order to find that, you gotta go back to your objective and see what, what was your objective? What did you want to do? Maybe you said because you wanted to have it fastest route, maybe travel time is the most important one. So you give this one, a bunch of judges do, you know, maybe 10 judges or 50 judges. Each of them give a score and then you get the average of those score. Maybe the average of those score comes to be eight. The safety, they think that maybe that's very important and they give it six as a environmental impact. They think that's very important. That might give it seven. The cost, they might say that that's very important. So they give nine and not close to residential. Maybe that end up to five. So these are the ranking of the criteria. Which one is the most important one? and you rank them. Now, now you have the project A and project B, two highways. Then you find out that how good the project A is with respect to the travel time. If that is the least travel time, you give that score of maybe again nine. But this is taking longer, you might give a five. As far as safety is concerned, maybe you get this eight, but this gives you six because it's going like this. The environmental impact of this one gets to be better so you will give this seven and then you will give this one five. But the cost of this, this road, because it's straight, is very high. So you might give the cost of this one, maybe three, and you give this one eight. Not close to the residential area, so this one is not close, so you give this eight, but you give this five. So this is how well the A and B is doing with respect to this criteria. Now, how do you find which one is better? Well, simply what you do, you multiply these important criteria that you taught by these numbers. 
and then find the final score. So 10, 8 times 9 give you 72, for instance. 6 times 8 is give you 42. This is 49, okay? So you get those numbers. You add them up together. You do the same thing with these, bunch of these. And then you add them together. And you find which one is the getting the highest score. And that's the one that we choose. Does everyone follow me? So then we included air pollution, noise pollution, <coughs> you know, safety, residential removal, all of these that we could not quantify. We put them into our formula and we evaluate them. So this is the way we do most of our cost effectiveness analysis. I put it in very, very simple term. This is a very important analysis by itself is a class that is being taught for the whole semester, how to do this. Because all the transportation projects are being done on cost effectiveness analysis evaluation. I remember that many years ago, I've worked on one of these cost effectiveness analysis for four possible alternatives that we had between LA and Orange County. So County of LA and County of Orange County were involved and couple on a uh, consulting firm. And I worked for one of them. And we did this cost effectiveness analysis for these projects. It took us six months to do it and the pro budget of it at that time, which was like almost 40 years ago, at that time, we spent about $1.2 million on it to do the evaluation. So even coming up with this criteria, it takes a long time to see what are the best criteria, designing the objectives, <coughs> ask all the residents, keep the, uh, a lot of uh, uh, workshops, with a lot of citizens to identify what are the most important criteria and so on and come up with the final scores. So it's a lot of work to be done. I made it very, very simple for you here. So if I ask you a question, what's the purpose of cost effectiveness analysis? What would you say? Why do we do cost effectiveness analysis? I said it throughout the whole session. Why do we do it? Well, the reason we, we are doing it, I mentioned that several times, to incorporate cost or benefits that are not quantifiable, which means that are not easy to put a dollar value on it, such as environmental cost, safety cost, travel time costs and others, psychological costs. We cannot put a dollar value on it. So that's the reason we are doing cost effectiveness analysis. Any question? All right, so that complete our chapter 10, which was all the evaluation of the alternatives. <clears throat> Next thing we want to talk about is your chapter four, which is the traffic flow. You have to get familiar with the traffic flow.
You have to get familiar with traffic flow. So what are the traffic flow ele elements? The first thing we can say is volume, volume of traffic. What's the definition of volume? Is the number of vehicles passing a point during a specific period of time. So if this is a roadway and I'm standing here and I'm just counting the number of cars that pass me. So if I start my stopwatch and measure and count, how many car passing me? That will be the volume of traffic. So if 100 cars pass me, I said 100 vehicle per hour. The unit is vehicle per hour. So that's the volume of traffic. You have seen that sometimes that there are roadways that they put a holes, go across. <coughs> so that measure the number of cars or number of axles that go over that holes. And there's a device here that counts that. And they bring it into the office and somebody go over there and observe what percentages of the uh, vehicle are two axles, what percentage are three, what percent are four. And then they figure out what, what <laughs> <laughs> what was the number of cars that passed that hole? <coughs> so this is the volume of traffic. Now, there are different types of volume that we measure. One is the yearly volume. So we want to know how many cars are going in any area per year. So we can say vehicle per year. That's one indication. We can have the monthly volume. That's a vehicle per month. Then the most common one is the daily volume. And daily volume is the number of vehicle per day. Now on the daily volume, the way we measure it, we have to get the average. We cannot just go measure one day and they say, this is the day, daily volume. <coughs> so you get the average. So we have two types of average. One is called AADT. And another one is called ADT. You probably see both of those. AADT stands for annual average daily traffic. Okay, these are all in page uh, 82 of your book. Average annual daily traffic. The other one is called ADT is basically is average daily traffic. And both of them are average. What's the difference between these two? 
Well, in order to get the AADT, you got to get the data for 365 days. That means every day, the whole year, and get the average. So you get the volume, summation of all this volume, and you divide that by 365. So every day you measure it to see how much it is for 365 days. And then you divide by 265, you get the AADT. For ADT, you don't have to get 365. You can get any number of days, doesn't matter. Let's say you get 10 days, 15 days, 20 days, anything less than 365 days. And then you get the summation, and then you divide by number of days that you did. So that's called ADT. So you guys understand what's the difference between AADT and ADT is? Any question on that? Okay, good. Now, the next thing we want to talk about, we have a P car. So we talk about daily traffic. Then we talk about hourly. We, go, we have a P car traffic. The P car traffic is the maximum of the number of volumes. <clears throat> so this is during a.m., which is in the morning or p.m. We have two peak hours. You remember we had this type of a graph. This is the a.m. peak, usually 7 to 8 a.m., and this is about 5 to 6 p.m., but it changes. So this is the a.m., peak, this is the PM peak. So we call peak our traffic. All right. Any question? Well, when we are measuring it, we are measuring it every 15 minutes. So there is a table that's given to you Okay, which is uh, time period. In page 82. So we measure between 6 to 615. 615 to 630. 630 to 645. And 645 to 7. So if that is the peak hour, now we measure the number of vehicles. That was the volume, correct? Volume every 15 minutes. We found 500 here. We found 575 here. We found 425 here. And we found 2000, uh, uh, no, 500 here. and 425. So when I added these together, total is 2000. So that means your total volume during the peak hour period was 2000. Every 15 minutes we measured those. So that's your peak hour traffic during your PM. <coughs> So we can have similar to this on the AM. Another thing we wanna know is what is the rate of flow? Eighty two, page eighty two, yes. What's the rate of flow?
the rate of flow is vehicle per hour, which is called rate of flow. rate of flow, vehicle per hour. So it's 500 is for 15 minutes. We want to know what is the rate of flow. So since there are four 15 minutes, let's say assuming that all the 15 minutes, 500 each of them went. So that will be rate of flow will be this times four, give you what, 2000. That means 2000 vehicle per hour. That's your rate of flow for between 6 to 6.15. What would be the rate of flow for between 6.15 to 6.30? Will be 5.75 times 4. It give you 2,300. 